So our next speaker is Christopher McLaughlin. Uh, yeah, let's put up. Okay. <clears throat> So Chris is a nationally registered EMT paramedic who has traveled to Haiti several times to provide primary care and relief to the people who live in the city of uh, Petit Guev. I think I said that right. Okay. Um, <laughs> funded by an advanced study grant, Chris spent the summer refining his Haitian Creole fluency and studying the neonat neonatal behavioral observation system used to attenuate parents to their infants' unique attitudes and behaviors in the postnatal period. During his most recent trip to Haiti in July, he applied the MBO system to 12 different infants and translated the results back to the parents of these newborns so that, they, so that these parents could then personalize their infant's care. Chris has a strong interest in neonatal development and the maternal-neonatal relationship and hopes to continue working with newborns in the future. He enjoys coffee, science, and teaching. <laughs> And Chris's talk is titled, Listening to, to Babies, Using the MBO System to Improve Postnatal Care at Home and Abroad. All right. There we go. All right, so first of all, thank you, Mike, for the, for the introduction. Um, so my talk is entitled, Listening to Babies, um, using, it, using the Neonatal Behavioral Observation System to Improve Postnatal Care at Home and Abroad. So post postnatal care is the care that's given within zero to three months after birth, um, and that's the primary application of this system. So what's my background? Besides what Mike already said, um, I work in Haiti. I work with other paramedics. Um, we're pretty well suited to working down there because we actually are used to not having what we need to. We're used to having to improvise in the field. Um, so we're kind of used to that kind of environment. Uh, most of the work that I do is in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, and pediatrics, kind of the postnatal care aspects of it as well. Um, so this study, my advanced study grant came out of the experiences that I had in the delivery room and kind of with the Haitian culture that surrounds the delivery room. Um, a lot of it had to do with, uh, I discovered that parents really didn't name their newborns uh, until two weeks after birth because there's such a high infant mortality rate that they really don't want to bond with their child unless you know, the child's going to survive. So two weeks is when they have a baptism, they name the baby. So this high infant mortality rate, kind of a problem, because it's preventing mothers from connecting to their children early on, which as Dr. Nugent, who I'll talk about in a little bit, has proven, that is super important in neonatal development. So that was my goal. I want to improve infant mortality. Doing it in Haiti, though, involved first learning the language. So my advanced study grant had two components. One was to improve my fluency in Haitian Creole, obviously the national language of Haiti. Um, and the, the other was to figure out a way to connect parents to their newborns. Um, I wanted to eliminate the need for a translator in the delivery room and kind of after that. Being able to connect directly with these parents meant a lot more to me, and I'm, I hope it meant a lot more to them. Um, my results will kind of show that, that it really did work. But let me get there first. So if I connect parents to their newborns, obviously I can improve that relationship and hopefully decrease the infant mortality. That's the, again, that overarching goal. So through what I can describe only as pure serendipity, turns out we have both of those goals accomplishable in the backyard of Boston College, uh, the city of Boston. So down at the Harbor campus at UMass Boston, they actually run a Haitian Creole Language Institute. It's a three-week course, three hours a day, um, and that really, really did help to refine my fluency. Um, I really was not as confident uh, as I am now. So having this program really helped me better connect. Um, and then the NBL, that Neonatal Behavioral Observation System, came, and the MBAS, came out of Children's Hospital Boston with this gentleman, Dr. Kevin Nugent, who runs the Brazelton Institute down at the Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Kevin Nugent is also a BC alum. He got his bachelor's here in philosophy and then went on to get a PhD in developmental psychology from the psychology department. So very close to home. Um, so what is the Neonatal Behavioral Observation System? It's a collection of 18 of these really small assessments that when we put them together, they can tell us a lot about an infant's personality, about the way that infants act, and the way that infants kind of perceive the world. Um, so I just highlighted a few um, of the implications here. Obviously, physically, we can tell about their muscle tone, emotionally, you know, what's gonna stress them out, what isn't gonna stress them out, what's the best way to go about resolving their stress. Um, their favorite method of communication, some babies prefer senses over others, some babies will touch, 
whereas others will use their eyes or their, their nose, something like that. Um, and developmental, we can also use this kind of as an assessment where we assess for reflexes, development of senses, development of autonomic functions, motor functions, organizational, state regulation. Um, but the goal in all of this is to attenuate parents to their infants. We want parents to see what their infant can and can't do, or what their infant can do and what their challenges are, what they need to work on. So if they can do that and we can identify those areas, we can improve the care delivered to that child over a given amount of time. So here's my case study. This was all the proof that I needed uh, to, to know that this works. Um, so this is Kayla. You can't really see it that well on this, but she is actually smiling, and that's why I had to include this picture. Um, she's laying on her little frog blanket here. We gave every baby that we met like a blanket, some so like a onesie or something, just because you know we want to take as good care of them as we can. Um, so this is Kayla. She's a two-month-old female. I met her in the pediatrics unit of Hopital Notre Dame, which is a hospital that we work in in Petiguav. Um, and she was in there for fevers. Mom said that she was just having some night fevers. So working with mom, and actually dad wasn't there, so I worked with little brother instead. Um, mom and little brother, uh, we assessed the baby using the MBL. And one of the big things that I saw when I assessed the baby was she had an extreme light sensitivity when she was sleeping. So to assess that, we take a flashlight, we just flash it in the baby's eyes while they're sleeping, so the eyes are closed, um, and the baby's eyes will twitch. Normally, after four or five flashes, the babies habituate to it. They stop reacting. Kayla, however, after 10 flashes, continued to react, continued to twitch. So I said to mom, mom, you see the twitching, and she, she acknowledged it. So I said she has an extreme you know, light sensitivity. She's very sensitive to light, so when she's sleeping, make sure that it's dark. Left that day, you know, no problem. Everything went pretty well. I think I did another assessment or two when I left. Two days later, mom shows up at my house. And the first question out of my mouth is, how did you find out where I live? <laughs> and mom's response was, well, all I had to do was ask where the white people live. <laughs> because obviously I'm a different color than the native Haitians. Um, and so the second question was, why are you here, obviously? And so she told me that for the past two nights, this is, and remember, it was two days later, Kayla had slept through the night. So I asked her, you know, what did you do differently? What did you change that, that did this? She said they have one lamp in the house, and it's in the bedroom. She moved it out of the bedroom and into their front room, and as a result, she attributed Kayla's sleeping to the lack of light in the bedroom. So this was all the proof that I needed to work, that it works. Um, and when she thanked me, she said, she said thank you, um, and when she thanked me, she used a very specific Haitian Creole word. She said the word palé. Um, anybody in here take French? French? PJ, what does parlé mean in French? To speak. In Haitian Creole, palé means speak. So she said, thank you for speaking for my baby, as opposed to talking or using words. She said speaking. And so that's kind of when I realized that that's what this is all about. You're using, your voice is the baby's voice. You're interpreting what the baby is doing, what the baby is saying, and just telling mom what they're saying. You're just an interpreter, you're the middleman. All right, so I eliminated the need for one middleman and created the need for another. <laughs> so, um, why is this so great? I mean, obviously, I'm convinced it's great. Why is it so great for anybody else? It's a system, it's not an assessment. You're not diagnosing anything. You're identifying strengths and weaknesses. You're really not you know, diagnosing that they can't do something. Um, it's incredibly flexible. You can stop and start at any time. You can omit points, do them later. Um, I've done that several times. It works just as well. Um, we always do it with the parents because we want the parents to see what their baby can and can't do. That's the overarching point. Um, and we want to get the family story. You know, What is the infant's place in the family? What does the mom expect? What does dad expect? Um, and how can we you know, work with them to meet those expectations? So I divide the MBO into three sections. You have your sleeping points, your awake points, and your summation points. So your sleeping points um, begin with that habituation to light that I just described with Kayla, um, where you just flash and you look for the twitch. Same thing for sound. Most of the time, they'll twitch their arms or their legs. And again, they'll habituate to it. So after the fourth or fifth time, usually they'll stop. Um, and then we do what's called the transition to awake which is a very nice way of, if everything is going well, you wake the baby up, you watch them you know, kind of arouse out of their sleep state to an awake state um, through you undress and unswaddle them. You just unwrap them, you, know, you want to check 
You want to get to the awake point, uh, the awake points, which are divided into two categories. I divide them into two, ca two categories. Physical responses, personal responses. So your physical responses, rooting and sucking, both have to do with feeding cues and feeding tendencies. Rooting is a reflex that the majority of babies will exhibit when you touch around their mouth. When you touch around their mouth, they will actually turn to the side that you touch. And that has to do, it's an inherent reflex that all babies are born with that helps them connect, obviously, when they need to feed. Um, and then we assess for sucking, rhythmicity, strength, and this all has to do with being able to talk to mom about how well the baby eats. All right, so great picture. Um, all these pictures were taken by uh, my friend Kelsey, who goes down to Haiti with me. She's a photography major at Temple um, and a psychology major too, so really worked out well for me because um, I have all these awesome pictures. So this is me. I'm, if you can see here, the baby's mouth is kind of open, and I'm just touching around the baby's mouth. So they'll open their mouth. They'll turn towards the side that I'm touching. All right, so next is muscle tone, arms and legs. We'll like flex their arms and legs, watch them retract. Um, hand grasp, you place your thumb in the baby's palm and you just feel for that, that grasp, how strong they are. Um, and that's when you, know, you make all kinds of comments to mom about how strong the baby is and how great they are. Because again, this is all positive. Um, and again, there's really no right response. So you don't have to say anything. Um, so hand grabs, and again, this is something that babies will exhibit within the first hours after birth. So this is a baby less than an hour old and already grabbing things. Um, this baby, I remember this assessment because I had to tell mom that she needs to keep this baby wrapped up, otherwise he's gonna grab everything in sight. <laughs> so the pull to sit and the crawl response are two more kind of reflexes that we look for. Um, just kind of how well the baby's neck holds up, um, how well, how strong the baby's neck and shoulder muscles are. Um, and then we'll, we'll put them on their bellies and watch for arm and leg movement. All right, we'll look for a crawl response. So here's a great example of me doing a pull to sit, um, pulling this baby up. Obviously, she slumped a little bit forward, so I think I did talk to mom about neck tone on this one. But you can see, you just pull them forward and you watch for their shoulders. You can feel if they pull back, all right? Um, so then the personal responses. And these all have to do with kind of getting mom and dad involved too because I don't want to stand there and, and you know, do all these things and play with the baby by myself. Again, the whole point, get mom and dad involved. Get mom and dad to appreciate their infant. So I'll hold the baby, you know, I'll move my head back and forth, watch the baby respond to my face and my facial movements. I'll call the baby's name, you know, see what happens. And then I'll say to mom, mom, go like stand next to me, um, say the baby's name. And the baby will recognize mom's voice 90% of the time. And Dr. Kevin Nugent always says that that other 10%, you always tip their head because again, positive reinforcement. We want parents to appreciate their infants. So we'll get mom and dad involved. Um, tracking the red ball, we take a red ball, we put it in front of the baby's face. We go back and forth. We watch the baby's eyes track that ball. And dads, for some reason, love to do this. Uh, every time I did it with a dad present, he always wanted to turn. And uh, the one time I went back to the pediatric unit, I had a dad, had a who had a tennis ball. He had found a tennis ball and was doing it like constantly, like nonstop. Because um, he, I guess he just thought it was, it was great. So I'm not gonna argue with him. Uh, he, did, he liked it, he enjoyed it. So uh, finally, then we'll just do a turning to rattle. I'll just shake the rattle on one side and, and the baby can hear, obviously, so the baby's head will turn. All right, so then your summation points. So these are the points that we talk about. I kind of just talked with mom about, about, you know, does the baby cry a lot? What can we do to stop the crying? Um, you know, what helps the crying? What stops the crying? Do you just feed right away? And we'll talk about things that you can do to, to help babies stop crying. Um, soothability and self-soothing. One of the things that I was most impressed with and that I learned from this observation system was a baby's ability to self-soothe. I watched a two-day-old baby bring their hands up to their mouth and they like actually start to suck on their fist. Two days old and they're already learning that that is a way to calm themselves down. Um, so self-soothing, incredibly important, and I think incredibly impressive. Um, state regulation, obviously, do they sleep for long periods of time? Do they not sleep for long periods of time? Do they wake up, stay awake for a while? Are they daisy? Do they you know, respond well? Um, their response to stress and their activity level, just things that we talk with mom about. So this is me doing recording, and again, we record all the time with mom and dad. You discuss with the parents everything that you find. 
And these are the things that we hope to accomplish and we hope to talk about with mom. Um, the family story, where that family, is, where the infant is in the family, um, the stimulation threshold, you know, what's overstimulating the baby? What do you reach that overstimulates the baby? What happens that makes the baby cry? Um, understanding the baby's cues, how does the baby communicate with mom? Is it through eye, eye contact? Is it through, you know, hand and, and leg movements? Um, the need for containment or support, obviously if the baby's floppy, doesn't have very good muscle tone, we want to contain the baby as much as possible. Uh, feeding, we talked about that with rooting and sucking. Just things that you could talk to mom about, you know, what helps, what doesn't help. Maybe feeding in a different position, feeding with the lights off, feeding with the lights on. Um, crying and communication and temperament. You know, how much does the baby cry, how often? And what kind of things calm the baby down? Does the baby exhibit self-soothing? And if not, you know, that's something I tell mom about and say, look for this. And when you see that, enforce it. Let the baby calm himself down. So implications for caregiving. It's done together with the parents. I think I've nailed that home more than a couple times now. Um, parents get to see the capabilities of their infant. They can see what their infant can and can't do. All right. And the opportunities for parent involvement, like I said, with the dad and the tennis ball, they repeat parts of it later. All right, they get impressed or they get happy with what their baby can do and they stop focusing on what their baby can't do or what a, you know, a problem that their baby is to their lives. They focus on the infant as part of their family. So we also can point out and label things parents may already know but not recognize. A lot of parents will realize that they need to support the baby's head but not to hear you say it is kind of an affirmation for them. Like, oh, I, well, I definitely need to do it now. Um, and finally, it's the opportunity for parents to see the areas that their baby needs improvement in, whether it's sensory, motor, muscular, anything, all right? So why is this important for a healthcare system? Number one is it's cheap. Your supplies consist of a plastic red ball, a flashlight, and a rattle. You can probably make two out of those three things. Um, it's non-invasive, there's no drugs, there's nothing negative about it, it's all positive, right? No right answer, it's a system, not an assessment. Um, it improves the parent-infant provider axis of trust. Um, parents will trust you a lot more if you already tell them things that they know. To hear you say it is completely different from having them see it. Uh, and Dr. Kevin Nugent has shown it improves the perceived level of care. So parents get impressed when you can play and do all these different things with their, parent, with their infant. Um, and that's actually like a study that's been done. Uh, and you can perform multiples. One of the big, my, my goal and my theory for, for the application of the system in Haiti is that we observe for changes. So by my doing the observation system and applying the, the system to, to different infants, I can give parents kind of a baseline of their infant, what their infant's behavior is at baseline. Parents can then go on to recognize deviations from that baseline behaviorally before physical symptoms appear of a certain malady or of something. So the example is cholera in Haiti. Be babies will get belly pain, and so they'll become more agitated before they start exhibiting the physical symptom of diarrhea. Um, premature infants, it's great for, because you can track development. You can track the development of reflexes, track the development of um, the baby's motor movements, how they organize their behavior. And finally, it's really easy to train and teach. If I learned it, anybody can learn it. Um, but we do have to keep in mind, this is what it's all about. You know, you're in the background, mom and baby are kind of the focus of it all. Um, because the 10 minutes that you're there is a very short 10 minutes, all right? Baby and mom have a lifetime after you leave. So they need to be the focus of it. It's not about you. It's not about my research. It's about mom and baby, all right? And so with that, I want to thank my friends for being here. And thank ESS for, for having me and for letting me talk. And um, thank you for coming.